So Valentine's Day, if you didn't know, um, it was a, an official holiday all the way back in the 1300s, a, a holiday about love. But it wasn't until the 17th century that giving flowers on Valentine's Day became a really common thing. And now I read that there are about 250 million roses grown every year specifically for Valentine's Day. And did you also know that XOXO didn't always mean hugs and kisses? The X originally stood for the cross, the cross of Christ. So people would sign their letters XO, signifying the cross, and then the O was a kiss, like an oath or a seal. So it was like signifying that they were a Christian at the end of their letters. And then did you also know that last year, Valentine's Day 2023, Americans spent $26 billion dollars on Valentine's Day gifts and activities. And that includes 751.3 million spent on pet gifts <laughs> and 5.5 billion spent on jewelry. And I really hope you got a share of that. <laughs> Just tuck that away. This idea behind giving gifts on Valentine's Day is obviously it's about showing our love, right? That's how it all started. Now, it may have gotten a little bit out of hand <laughs> here in America. Um, and, you know, of course, there are lots of other ways that we express love in our relationships. Um, keeping promises, keeping our marriage vows, um, selfless acts, you know, putting the other person in the relationship before yourself, um, helping someone when they're unable to help themselves, protecting someone when they can't take care of themselves. These are all things that we do to show our love and are caring for others. And our relationships, whether it's marriage or in parenting or even just friendship, these are things that are meant to point to the type of selfless, intimate, and loving relationship that God wants us to have with him. And this is something that I've just generally been thinking a lot about lately. You know, when God just really puts something on your heart, it keeps coming up again and again. And it's this idea of just trying to grasp how much God must love me, <laughs> you know, how much he must love you. It's so simple, but it's so hard to wrap your mind around. Um, and so Valentine's Day is the perfect time to do this. And it starts by looking in scripture, looking for that evidence of God's love in scripture. And once you start looking, you see it everywhere. And we see that in Abraham's life, too. Um, as Nancy brought out last week, I thought so wonderfully, she pointed out that Abraham's faith isn't simply a result of how much he loves God, but it's a reaction to God's overwhelming outpouring of love on him. And so we see this evidence of God's love for Abraham all throughout his story. I mean, the fact that he chose Abraham as the one to bless with his nation, first of all. Um, but think about how patient he was with Abraham when he makes some missteps along the way. Um, think about how he protected Abraham when he went to go rescue Lot from that battle with all the kings. Um, and, he, you know, God even gave Abraham gifts, didn't he? He, not, maybe not jewelry, but he gave him uh, land, he gave him wealth, and as we see this week, he gave him a child. So, But the biggest way that we see God showing his love for Abraham is not those tangible things, but it's in how he shapes Abraham, how he helps him to grow in grace throughout his life. In each story we've seen in this account of Abraham for the last few weeks, Abraham's facing a trial or a choice, and sometimes he rises to the occasion and he faithfully obeys God or follows the path that God has laid out, and other times he doesn't. Other times he fails, like when he decided to try to make a baby with Hagar instead of waiting for God to provide the child that he promised, although God was still very patient with him. But in every situation that we see Abraham in, God is honing him. He's shaping him. He's helping him to grow in faithfulness and in grace throughout his life. It's a little bit like when you're waxing your car. Or maybe a better example is like when you're exfoliating in the shower. <laughs> you know, you've got that body wash with the abrasive beads in it. It's a little bit uncomfortable when you're doing it. But afterwards, your skin is so smooth, right? We're seeing the process of Abraham's sanctification. God is polishing Abraham to a luster. So yes, his faith was credited to him as righteousness, but remember that it's not just faith that Abraham showed one time, and it's not perfect faith. It's faith through trial after trial. It's faith that has failed at times, but it's faith that's been steadfast and God-centered. 
Now, last week we left Abraham at a really low point <laughs> when he basically used Sarah to curry fav favor with this king Abimelech. It was not his finest moment. <laughs> and he's had some other low points too. But today in the lesson, we see Abraham's fa faith really strengthened. We're seeing that shine come as God is buffing him. Abraham's story seems to be building to a bit of a climax where we see him face his biggest trial that God has asked of him. So we'll be looking for that mm -hmm. evidence of God God's love today for not just Abraham, but how we can know that God loves us in the same way. So let's start with chapter 21. Just like in our lesson, I'm going to zip through kind of fast. So you might want to have your scripture handy just as a reference. But finally, Abraham and Sarah have their son. And I love the scene that's described here is so joyful and they're giving such glory to God. I'm going to read the first two verses. The Lord visited Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. So notice this language, the Lord visited Sarah, the Lord did to Sarah. It's clearly a situation that is a result of divine intervention. There's all this emphasis on the fact that this thing is happening because God had promised it, and now he's keeping that promise. So Abraham responds in faith by circumcising Isaac, by naming him Isaac, these things that God asked him to do. Isaac means he will laugh. So we, we've talked a lot about how laughter keeps coming up in this whole story of Abraham and Sarah having a child. And before it was laughter of disbelief or even bitterness on Sarah's part. Um, and now we see it's laughter of joy. It's laughter that God has brought on. It's hilariously wonderful, right? To think of this woman in her 90s chasing after a toddler, right? <laughs> how exhausting, <laughs> but also how exhilarating that must have been after this long, long wait. And Isaac was a true source of joy to his parents, not just because of who he was, but because of who he came from. It also seems to me that this naming of Isaac is a little bit like we're seeing God's sense of humor. You know, it's as if God was saying, you were laughing before when I said this was going to happen. And now every single time you say Isaac's name, you're going to remember how I was faithful and how I kept my promise to you. So why did God take so long to fulfill this promise? It's been, what, 13 odd years since he first promised a child. He could have done it back when Sarah was, you know, ripe in her 80s, <laughs> but he didn't. <laughs> Abraham's now 100 something, Sarah's in her 90s. It should have been impossible, as we know, for them to have a child. But that's really the answer, I think, that this absolute impossibility of the situation there's no other way that this elderly postmenopausal woman could have a child other than God's intervention. It is without question. Nobody seeing this happen could have denied it, that he is putting his blessing on this family. And of course, this promised long-awaited child points us to another long-awaited promised child um, who was, again, born to a woman who couldn't conceive, in that case, because she was a virgin, right? And if you think about it, a few chapters ago, God told Sarah, is anything too hard for the Lord? And that's really similar to what the angel told Mary, for nothing will be impossible with God. So we're seeing these little glimmers of God's ultimate plan for this family. So let's see now how Ishmael and Hagar react to this new little child who's running around. Um, fast forward a few years and... Um, Isaac is probably three or four now. Um, Abraham throws a big party to celebrate his weaning, and Sarah sees Ishmael bullying Isaac. It doesn't <laughs> specify, but it, that seems to be the thing that it is implied, that, um, that Ishmael is ridiculing little toddler Isaac. And Sarah's mama bear comes out. <laughs> and I think it's helpful to remember that Hagar, while she seems like the innocent victim in this story, remember back, you know, at this point, 18 years or so, that she ridiculed Sarah when Sarah couldn't have a baby, and she did. So I think this is Sarah sort of getting her revenge. In my, in my discussion group, we decided that this was kind of like the Real Housewives of Canaan. <laughs> when this is a little bit that moment, right? They're having this battle and Abraham's caught in the middle. And he's really torn because we know he loves Isaac, you know? Abraham, you know, I know God has been promising this other child, but Abraham might have thought deep down inside for a while at least that, I, that Ishmael was going to be 
the promised son, because for all he knew, he didn't have any other kids, right? But God visits Abraham and assures him that what Sarah is asking to send Ishmael and Hagar away, while maybe not motivated for the right reasons, it does align with God's plan, right? And that God's covenant blessing would come through Isaac, not Ishmael, but that God would take care of Ishmael and Hagar and make another great nation of him because of Abraham, for Abraham's sake, because God loves Abraham. So let's talk about this Galatians thing, that question that came up in our study, Galatians 4, 21 through 31, um, because you know, Paul is showing, using this situation, this dynamic between Isaac and Ishmael as a metaphor for the new covenant and the old covenant. So let me read here. He's explaining to the church in Galatia why they don't need to be under the law anymore. So this is Galatians, whoa, -oh, hang on. I tapped something. Galatians 4, uh, 22 to 23. So he says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave and the other by a free woman. But the one by the slave was born as a result of the flesh, while the one by the free woman was born through promise. So Paul goes on to talk about how Isaac, this one who was born in slavery, essentially, um, represents um, Mount Sinai, the law, um, the earthly city of Jerusalem, because trying to live under the law um, meant that you were a slave to it. No matter how hard you tried to obey it, you could never do it perfectly, no matter how hard you tried. And so the conception of Ishmael was a result of human effort. So it, Ishmael could not be the promised son. Now, in the New Covenant, right, after Jesus' <laughs> resurrection, believers like Isaac are spiritual children of the free woman, right? This re represents our freedom in Christ, our freedom from sin. We are no longer slaves to the law. And this also represents the heavenly Jerusalem as opposed to the earthly Jerusalem. So Paul talks about how the son of the captive can't share in the inheritance of the son of the free woman. Right. And that's a picture for heaven. Um, so this is also why Ishmael had to be sent away. Partly it was to clear the way. So it was very clear that Isaac was was going to receive the blessing. But it's because the son of the captive couldn't share. It's this picture of the gospel of redemption. So let's zoom ahead momentarily. Keep your finger where it was. We're going to look ahead at chapter 25, verses 12 through 18, where we kind of close out Ishmael. We're just going to, since he's only kind of mentioned peripherally after this, we learn that Ishmael had 12 sons. He became the father of the Arab nations who were the chief antagonists of the Israelites. So the same dynamic is continuing as their descendants go on. And if you remember back to Genesis 16, when Isaac was first born, an angel of the Lord said, his hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. So that's where we leave Ishmael in this story. So now to go on to this next little vignette, this covenant that Abraham makes with Abimelech. This is verses 22 through 34 of chapter 21. I'm going to try to keep us like on track of where we are in this giant thing of scripture. So God had fulfilled his promise of a son and of descendants. God had also promised to take care of Ishmael, and he has done that. And so this is an inkling of the next part of the promise, which is the promised land. Now, we don't know if this is the same Abimelech as the one we met a couple chapters ago. It's not sure. It's a different location. We're not really sure. But whatever, whether it's the same one or not, we can see that this Abimelech knows God, knows who God is, knows Abraham's God, and knows that Abraham is under God's protection. And so he saw that Abraham was being powerful. He was protected. So he wanted to make this agreement with Abraham for kind of mutual benefit and for his own protection. So this whole um, agreement over the well in verse 25, it really means that Abraham now has a legal right to live there. He may not own any land yet, but he can rightfully live there. And um, it also means that God's promise of land is sort of on its way to fulfillment. So Abraham, in responding in faith, plants this evergreen, long-lasting tamarisk tree to represent the enduring faithfulness of God 
And before, whether or not it's the same Abimelech that we're talking about, if you remember, Abraham before was like fearful, right? He was afraid of what was going to happen. He thought he would be killed, which is why he kept lying about Sarah, right? But here you can see really clearly that he is sort of on equal footing with this king. And he's much more bold and confident. And you have to maybe think that this changed attitude is stemming from the fact that he's seeing God's promises fulfilled, right? He has Isaac now. He's seeing these things happen. So his faith is being strengthened. So that is the principle. It's very simple. God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. And that is one of the ways that we can know that he loves us. God was faithful to Abraham, not because of Abraham's faithfulness, but in spite of Abraham's faithlessness, right? He keeps all of his promises to Abraham, even when Abraham doesn't always hold up his end of the covenant. So God keeps his promises. He kept his promises to Abraham. What are some of the things that God has promised us? I looked this up. And by one person's count, there are 7,487 promises that God makes to mankind throughout the Bible. (laughs) I did not confirm this (laughs) independently. Um, Let's just say there are a lot. But I'm going to focus on three big ones that Jesus makes to his followers and that he makes to us. Um, And I've given you some scripture references there on your handout. But for one thing, Jesus promised the resurrection, right? Again and again to his disciples. They might not have known what the heck he was talking about, but he promised it. And of course, we knew he kept that promise. And that is really the foundation for the gospel, right? The foundation for our whole faith. Jesus promised the Holy Spirit would come. Again, he says this multiple times, and I'm thinking particularly of Acts 1-8, um, right before you know the ascension, right, be- right as he's sending the disciples out. He promised the Holy Spirit, a helper would come. And I know you, know you and I know this to be true in our own lives. And then, of course, the promise that we haven't seen fulfilled yet, Christ's return. He promised to come back. So when you look at it in context, how can we doubt that that will happen, right? God keeps his promises because he's kept every promise faithfully. So how can we reflect on God's faithfulness in our own lives? You know, um, I know that just from talking to people and people's prayer requests, I know that I'm not the only one struggling sometimes with um, that uncertainty that can creep up in life, not knowing what's going to happen, difficult situations that come up. And in those moments, I think, Yes, look for for God's promise keeping in scripture, but also look for it in your own life, in your own past. Think about it. Write it down. (laughs) Because when you have those moments of, can I trust that you've got this, God? It's really helpful to rehearse back those many moments in your life when you have seen that, yes, indeed, he is faithful and he will keep his promises. So let's go on now to chapter 22. This is now, this is the biggest faith crisis that Abraham has faced. And it comes in a point in the narrative where you sort of least expect it. It seems like everything is kind of coming together. You know, all these obstacles have been overcome. God's faithfulness is more evident than ever. Um, Warren Wearsby said, Our faith is not really tested until God asks us to bear what seems unbearable, do what seems unreasonable, and expect what seems impossible. And I think that sums up what Abraham is facing here. This is now several years later. Isaac is probably at the very least an older teenager or maybe even in his early 20s. And God asks for Abraham to sacrifice his only beloved son as a burnt offering. And a burnt offering would have been a sin sacrifice, like to atone for sins. So they take this long 45-mile, three-day journey out to the mountains outside of Jerusalem, this land of Moriah. Um, And as we saw in our lesson, this is where the temple will be built. Um, This is also the same area where God will appear to David in 2 Samuel. And it is very near the likely place of Calvary, of where Jesus would be crucified. And I think it's interesting to note that there is zero mention of any sort of hesitation or doubting or questioning from Abraham. And even though Abraham has been faithful throughout, 
previous to this, if you think about it, he, there's there's often a little moment, right? It's it's Abraham kind of wondering, should I do what Sarah wanted me to do and send Ishmael and Hagar away? And God says, yes, yes. Or it's Abraham feeling moved to intervene when God shares his plans for Sodom and Gomorrah. It's Abraham laughing reverently, maybe, but still doubting that he would be able to have a child in his old age. There are all these instances of, of sort of hesitation, but there is none of that here. He gets up and he goes. We know from Hebrews eleven nineteen that at some point, whether it was right away or maybe somewhere along that very long journey, that Abraham reasoned that God would raise Isaac from the dead. And if you think about it from his point of view, it kind of makes sense because what does he know about God? right? He knows that God promised that they would have a son, and now they have one. He promised a land, and now he's seeing that happen. All of these things have happened. So why wouldn't God continue to keep his promise about a, na a blessed nation coming from Isaac? So he must be planning to bring Isaac back from the dead. Now, I have to think that maybe his confidence was a little bit shaken when Isaac spoke up in chapter 22, verse seven, verse 7, Isaac says, Father, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answers Isaac's question in a way that I think all parents can relate to. It's like truthful, but kind of vague about the details, right? <laughs> Abraham says, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And of course, he spoke much truer than he knew, right? We know who the lamb is that he's going to provide. Because it's finally 2,000 years later that John the Baptist actually answers Isaac's question of where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Because John says, he sees Jesus coming and says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, right? That's the answer to the question. That's the lamb that will be offered for our sins. He was provided by God, right? And Abraham actually kind of had the right idea. He was going to be raised from the dead, right? God intervenes in Isaac's situation, but, but you know, more truth than Abraham possibly realized. Now, we have to talk for a moment about Isaac in this situation and his faith, because at some point, Abraham must have told Isaac what was going to happen. And maybe he even shared that he believed that God would raise him from the dead, because why else would a fully grown, strong young man willingly lay down and be tied up by his, you know, centenarian <laughs> father? Um, and, you know, that question in our lesson I love and I want to just park on for a second of the other parallels we see to Christ. We've talked about a couple, but um, he was a beloved son to his father, the only beloved son. He also carried the wood for his own sacrifice, just like Isaac did. Christ submitted to his father willingly, right, in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Christ's death was ultimately to atone for sin, for our sins. And so in Isaac's case, God does intervene at, very dramatically at the last second. And God gives a new command not to sacrifice Isaac. Because Abraham had essentially already committed the sacrifice in his heart. It was a done deal. Now there are a couple of firsts here to point out. Um, this is the first mention of any sort of substitutionary sacrifice of one life for another. In this case, it's a ram, right? He doesn't have to sacrifice Isaac, so he finds this ram and sacrifices it in thanks and devotion to God. This is also the first and I believe only time in scripture where God swears an oath to himself. He swears by his own name. This is verses um, 16 through 18 of chapter 22. God says, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth, earth be blessed. So we have this, again, sort of a restatement of the covenant promises. And every time that this has happened, we learn a little bit more. We learn a little bit more about God's plan of blessing for Abraham's descendants. And here, when you read that section in the context of the New Testament, it just shouts the gospel, right? It's like now God is showing his whole ultimate plan for Abraham's descendants. 
and it's ultimately heading to Christ. It's easy, I think, in this story of Abraham and Isaac to dwell on Abraham's great faith in sacrificing his son, and absolutely, and even in Isaac's faith for willingly laying down, and again, also true. But I think the real point of the story isn't about Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son, but God's willingness to sacrifice his son to atone for our sins, right? Imagine how hard that was for Abraham and how hard that was for God. And God did not ask more of Abraham than he was willing to give himself. And so that's the principle. God won't ask us to do anything he wasn't willing to do. He won't ask us to do anything more than he was willing to do. So it comes back to kind of my initial question at the beginning. Why, why would he do that for us? It has to be for love, right? It's John 3.16. That's the only possible reason, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So what does Jesus ask of us? We looked a minute ago on, on um, you know, what promises God has made to us. Well, now what sacrifices does God want us to make, right? Thankfully, it's not our offspring, it's not animals, it's not even anything tangible, but we are asked to make some sacrifices for Jesus' sake, right? He asks us to sacrifice our old ways. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. That's 2 Corinthians. I think I wrote these references down, so. Um, he asks us to sacrifice our time by spending our time in the word. Meditate on it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. He also asks us to spend our time in prayer. Rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in everything. He wants us to sacrifice ourself. If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And ultimately, we are to sacrifice our lives for his sake. Whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. It's a tall order <laughs> to make those sacrifices faithfully, but it's, it's not accomplishing them. I think that's the point. It's this process of sanctification, right? This process of trying to faithfully respond to God's love for us in giving his son. This is God polishing us to a luster throughout our lives as we strive to make these sacrifices faithfully. And we won't do it perfectly, but then neither did Abraham. And look how loving and faithful God was to him. So this last section, I couldn't help myself. I had to call it two funerals and a wedding because that's what it is. <laughs> we have this little transitional section at the end of 22 um, about the descendants of Nahor. And really, this is sort of signifying a shift for, over from Abraham to Isaac and setting up some things that are going to happen in Isaac's life. But first, we have the first funeral. This is Sarah's death in chapter 23. And in this section, you know, Abraham's determination to buy the burial site for is not just about him showing love and respect for Sarah, but it's about his intention to remain there in Canaan. He's trusting that this is that promised land that God promised in the covenant. Um, and because it would have been typical for people to return back to their homelands to bury their dead. So this is really saying something here. And the Hittites he was bargaining with, these were the native Canaanites. And you have to think they were like, this guy's really powerful. I don't know if we want him to stay here, you know, so let's just give him a grave and then he'll move on. Right. And because it's they seem very respectful the way they're talking to him. You're a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. So they give him they offer to him the cave and eventually the whole field for free. So why didn't Abraham take it? Well, he wanted to own a piece of the promised land. He wanted to bury Sarah there. He wanted, eventually he will be buried there. Jacob will be buried there. All the daughters-in-law will be buried there. This is again about God's promises. And so even though Ephraim asked for this ridiculous price that was about 10 times the going rate for a good piece of land at the time, um, I love Abraham's response to this. He doesn't really say anything. He just sort of calmly reaches into his bag and pulls out the 400 pieces of silver and gives it to Ephraim in front of everyone so everybody knows what happened. And so now a small part of the promised land belongs to Abraham and he can put Sarah to rest there. <laughs> 
So go ahead a few years to chapter 24. Abraham is now very old, um, possibly bedridden or something. So he gives this task of finding a bride for Isaac to a trusted servant. He sends him back to Mesopotamia to find a bride. And Abraham's last recorded words are to this servant, and it is a statement of faith. He trusts that God will take care of the situation, that God will send an angel and kind of prepare in advance what's supposed to happen. So the servant goes on his way. He's got 10 camels loaded down with gifts, probably some jewelry in there. Actually, they talk about that, I think. I think jewelry is even mentioned. Verses 12 through 14 in chapter 24 is the first recorded prayer for specific guidance in scripture, which I think is really interesting because we see the servant take initiative, right? He comes up with this plan, which is basically to stand by the well and look thirsty and see what the ladies do. Um, But he comes up with a plan, but then he very clearly leaves it in God's hands. This is that old saying, God can't steer a parked car right? He makes a plan. He takes a step forward in faith, but leaves the result up to God. So Rebecca comes and it's clear from what happens that she's the answer to his prayer. She tells her father and brother what happened. They invite the servant over to share a meal. And then the servant recounts the entire story again, (laughs) very eloquently and in great detail. And I don't know about y'all, when I read this, I was like, why are we going through this again? Didn't we just hear this story? But it is from the servant's first person point of view. He does bring out some more details. And there is more emphasis on God's involvement and provision in the whole situation. And I think that's one of the reasons that that, uh, Rebecca's father and brother kind of willingly give her up because they can't deny (laughs) what that God's hand is in this. And I think that's significant, you know, spoiler alert for a couple chapters ahead when uh, Jacob is having dealings with these same people and it doesn't go quite the same way. So Rebecca comes back with the servant and then the scene shifts. It's like a cross dissolve, like a Hallmark movie. And the scene shifts to Isaac coming down from this place of prayer. Maybe he was praying for his new wife and he immediately sees Rebecca and falls in love. So what is the significance of this long chapter? Um, I think there's a lot of things we can pull out from it. For one thing, again, we're seeing God's faithfulness to his promise in providing for the future of Abraham's descendants in providing a wife for Isaac. Um, I think we're also seeing a picture of God's selection of a bride for his own son, right? The church. It gives us a little picture of that. But the thing that I took from it the most was this model of a good and trusted servant who responded properly to the work of God, right? He prayed before acting. He praised God for his answered prayers, and he believed that God would provide. So that is the principle I want to bring out here. A servant-hearted believer prays before acting, praises God for answered prayers, and trusts in God's provision. Praise, praises, and trusts in God's provision. So how are we following that model? I think it's interesting that the servant is never named. He could have been, but he's not. And to me, that makes it even more of like a model to follow. Um, Are we turning to God in prayer in, in those moments of decision or indecision? Are we truly earnestly trusting that he will provide an answer in his time and in his way? It's definitely much easier said than done. But again, I think it's such a helpful uh, model to follow. Now, I have not forgotten about the second funeral. Kind of to close us out, let's talk about Abraham's death. How did this man, this friend of God, This man who was remembered for his faith, how did he leave the world? Well, he left it also in faith. And he ensured that God's covenant blessing would be Isaac's by sending his other sons away, by giving all of his inheritance to Isaac. He sent the others away with gifts. He provided for them, but he wanted it to be clear that Isaac gets this land. Isaac is the source, is the the, the recipient of God's blessing moving forward. Um, In verse 11, chapter 25, verse 11, it says, After the death of Abraham, God blessed Isaac, his son. And that's our final indication that God is continuing this covenant blessing. 
So Abraham's story ends when he is 175, Isaac was 75, and Jacob, even though we haven't met him yet, was 15. And Abraham lived 100 years in the promised land under the provision of God. So he must have died contented and at peace. God, we see him lovingly shaping Abraham throughout his entire life. He's had opportunity after opportunity for faithfulness as he has faced all of these trials and obstacles and choices and wins and losses. He grew in strength of faith. He grew more and more in step with God, we see, as he walked through his life. And so that's my prayer for us as we close. So as you celebrate or not ignore completely Valentine's Day today, um, I just want to challenge you a little bit to reflect on this, reflect on how much God loves you, how he shows his love for you. It's not just in answered prayers or various gifts, but it's in this shaping process, the sanctification through all of the ups and downs of our lives. That's our indication of God's love. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you so much um, for this time together this morning. We pray as we go forward that um, the truths that we've learned from Abraham's life of not only his um, steadfast faith, but more, Lord, your faithfulness, your loving um, shaping of each and every one of us, and your walking with us um, as we, you know, imperfectly um, uh, uh, obey and respond um, in faith to you. So Lord, we just ask for strength, for wisdom. We ask for that wisdom to behave like the servant did in turning to you in prayer and in trusting in your provision. And Lord, we love you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.